talking about the mini series that we embarked on just a couple of weeks ago. And just I have a graphic there for you, friends, to see where we're coming from, where we are, and where we are coming from. We started with a study on the Old Testament, why the Old Testament is still valid. We went to study the covenants, and we studied the Old, Te the old Covenant, the New Covenant, and we moved into the law, a term that is very general in the Bible, and we studied that, that and discovered that there are two divisions of this law, and we moved into the law of Moses, and we studied the law of Moses together. But today I want to invite you to go even to go even more specific on what law part of the law of Moses we are or the Bible teaches. And that is the transition. All those one, two, three, four, five messages are or will be available this afternoon already on our different platforms on the internet if you want to share it with anyone or just go back and wrestle with the text once again or with my accent. So some, some people need to hear again at least twice um, um, those, those messages because of what I just mentioned. So please, friends, this will be on, online pretty soon. I just wanted you to see the flow, and today will be the last one of these five messages on the topic. The, the passage that I want us to reflect upon is found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to, through 17. Many scholars believe that this is one, if not the most difficult passage to understand in the Bible. And we're talking about people that have been studying this for a while, and they believe this could be the most difficult passage in the whole Bible. But we have, uh, we have the gift of God to study the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the tutor. The Holy Spirit is the master, the one that wants to make the passages clear. So we rely on Him and what He wants to do today with us. This is what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2. And I want to propose to you, friends, that this, is, this, this passage right here not only can be the toughest passage in the whole Bible, but it can also be the more rewarding and the more delightful and the more enlightful of all the passages in the Bible. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. The passage starts saying, let's go directly to the passage, friends. Keep your Bible open in that passage because we will not move so much out of that passage and you Paul, the writer of the of the letter to the colossians says you 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 pointing a finger to each one of us you being dead in your trespasses you being dead of your trespasses what is paul talking about friends our trespasses is that which has taken us away from the lord and because we were away from the lord from the fountain of life we were dead but he says, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. Jesus has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The word, the word forgiveness or forgiven here in the, in the text, in the Greek, is a very interesting word. It, it, its root is the word "hais." Now, the word haris is where we have the word grace. What can we learn about this forgiveness? Is it because of what you do? You receive forgiveness of God because you ask for it? You receive forgiveness of God because of you, what you don't do? According to haris, the forgiveness of God is simply given to you out of grace. Out of grace. God forgives me not because I stopped doing this or I started doing that. God forgives me because He's gracious. Because God is grace. Forgiving you all the trespasses, says that, says Paul. But now the question here, friends, God has given me out of His grace forgiveness. The question here is, when did this happen? When did this take place? And the answer, simple answer to this, friends, is at the cross. At the cross. But wait, wait, wait. If that happened at the cross, which happened about 2,000 years ago, what about the years before? What about the 4,000 years of sin and trespasses before the cross? Who pays for that? Who pays for that? 
Well, the Bible continues giving us answers to these questions. And as we move to a transition to the next verse, we will see that the answer to that question, who pays for that, is actually found in the following verse, verse 14. This is what Paul says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This passage has brought so much dilemma about people that study the Bible. And they understand these passages in different ways. But let's see what the Bible actually says, friends. The word that you have to pay attention to first is the word handwriting. Which word, friends? Handwriting. The word handwriting occurs just one time in the whole Bible, in the Greek. Just right here in Colossians chapter Chapter 2 and verse 14. Handwriting is actually a compound word. It comes from the, the word uh, hero and the word graphon. Hero means hand in Greek. And graphon means writing. So simply translated, directly translated, literally translated, this word um, hero graphon is actually handwriting. That's why you see that in the English. Handwriting. What is, what is the novelty about that? This hierographon was actually a legal document back then, by the time that this was written. It was a certificate of, of debt. In other words, and for us that are living in this 21st century, this was a bond. It was a bond. This was a document which was a note written by hand in which one acknowledged that money had either been deposited with him or lent. To him by another to be returned at the appointed time hmm in other words friends something was promised before the cross that was fulfilled paid by the cross Are you still with me say amen please so what is a bond i said a bond is another word another modern word that i will use to um to identify this greek word a bond, simply put, is a, is, a, is a loan from an investor to a borrower. It's a loan from an investor to a borrower. So, so friends, when a, a repentant sinner was to bring his offering to the temple, he would bring the animal to offer it to before a priest after the divine trans transaction, giving, giving his sins to the animal, and symbolically the animal will give give his life to the, 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 the transgressor, he or she will receive forgiveness at that very moment. But how, where were the basis for this person to receive forgiveness? The basis were, uh, the basis were on the bond. The basis were on the bond, just like a bond that is used when a person is sent to, the, to prison. And that bond is signed and written so that the person can get out. The bond then simply said, somebody will pay for you. Somebody will pay for you. So what is this handwriting talking about, friends? Again, remember, it's a certificate of debt. Jesus paid. The one that died on the cross paid for that certificate of debt. Let's continue accumulating information here. Not only says, verse 14, that this handwriting is, a, is the certificate of debt. It also says that the certificate of debt or the handwriting of requirements. This word requirement is a very useful as well to reason through and analyze what the word means. The word requirement can also be translated into ordinance. And once you hear the word ordinance, that should light... Um, 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 something in your mind to remember where we heard that word ordinance before. The Greek word for the word ordinance or requirement is the word dogma. Dogma. According to the strong uh, dictionary, the word dogma can also mean a law which is either civil or ceremonial. Continue thinking through this. Now, this handwriting of requirements ordinances, the text says that is against us. It was contrary to us. And here's a third question that we need to answer. What was contrary to us? Because we're trying to realize what was really nailed to the cross. What was contrary to us? 
what was against us. And here is one of the, one of the principles that we have learned about interpreting the Bible. The Bible explains itself. Can you say it with me? The Bible explains itself. Let me take you to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and 26, where we find again that same phrase against us. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 26 says, Take this book of the law, and we already identified that the book of the law is the law of Moses, and put it, how do we know? Put it beside the Ark of the Covenant. How do we know this is not the, the, the law of God of Ten Commandments? Because the law of God and Ten Commandments was put where? Inside the Ark. So we're not talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the other law that was next to the Ark. It's called the Book of the Law. And put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. That it may be there. This book, not the Ten Commandments. This book will be there as what? Witness against you. The same phrase. The same phrase. Do you see it? Now, let me give you more information on dogma. The word dogma, that is translated into ordinance or requirement, is used by Paul only one more time in what is considered a parallel verse to this, to this verse. Just one time. This one time that Paul talks about, uses this word dogma in his writings, says the following. This is found in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15. Again, you will see that all this enriches your understanding of the text. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15 says the following. Having abolished in the flesh the enmity against us, contrary to us, that is, the law of the commandments contained in ordinances. There is the word again. Are we talking about the same thing, yes or no? Yes, 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 family. We're talking about the same thing. Paul is talking about the same thing. Um, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. That's making peace. It's talking about the same book that was on the side. It, it was, it's talking about the same uh, commandments contained in ordinances, dogma, that is again on the side. No, the, the, the commandments that are inside of the ark. Are you still here, friends? Now, who is us here? Because it says against us. We need to understand who Paul is referring to to know if the information we're getting out of the text is actually accurate. Who is us? If you go to verse 12, the same chapter, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, you will see that Paul is, is making a clarification of whom he, this message is to. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, you have your Bibles open. It says, buried with him, this is Jesus, in baptism, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Who is us, friends? Who is us? Who is us in the text? Those who have been baptized. How are they called? God's people. Who is Paul referring to? So this law is against God's people. Those who have been buried, those who have been baptized in Jesus. We're collecting information. Is that all right? So here's the question. Because the verses start saying that this, which was, um, this that was uh, a requirement, this was, that was a handwriting requirement, this was wiped out. But it not only says that it was wiped out, at the end of the verse it says that it was nailed to the cross. So here's the question. What was nailed to the cross? Is it the whole law of Moses? Or is it part of it? All of it or part of it? The word nailed to, since you're asking about this, this word, let me tell you. The word nailed to is another fascinating word. It's only found, this phrase, is only found here in this text. Nowhere else. It comes from the Greek prosoleo, or proso, proselo, excuse me, proselo. And this Greek word is only found in this text, nowhere else. And this word means, prosolo means, took it out of the way. So when, when the Bible says that this was nailed to the cross, it says that it was took, uh, that was taken out of the way. How many of you were here last week with, with, when Pastor Henderson preached this morning? Let me see your hands. 
in the morning, Sabbath morning. Do you notice that he, every time he preached, he put the pulpit away? Do you notice that he took, took the pulpit and put it over here? Because he is what is known as an extemporaneous preacher. One preacher that doesn't, doesn't need or doesn't use uh, outline or script. They just go by memory. I don't have that blessing. So I need my pulpit. I need my notes. I need my Bible to see where I'm going. So that's why I need the pulpit here so that I can put all this material on. Pastor Henderson didn't need that. And because he didn't need that, he put it, he took it away. He took it away, not because it was bad, not because there is something wrong with the pulpit. He took it away, not because there is something bad about the pulpit. He took it away because he did not need the pulpit. You with me, friends? That's exactly what happened with which, whatever is being described here that I want you to keep in your mind. So again, what was nailed to the cross? Fair question. We can speculate. We can say our feelings. We can say whatever uh, preconception we have. But what is the best way to answer that question? The Bible, friends. The Bible. So Paul will not, will not bring that question to our minds and then just leave it, leave it hanging there. Because first, verse 15 will answer the question. What was nailed? See, in verse 15, in verse 15 we find now that it says that that Satan and his minions were exposed at the cross. They show the real colors at the cross. They were exhibited through the sacrifice of the Son of God at the cross. They thought they had defeated God, but little did they know the cross, in fact, is the greatest demonstration of God's triumph over evil. Friends, God wins God wins and verse 15 there in the middle of this passage is there as a testimony is there as a witness for you and for me to know that we are conquerors in Jesus some of you don't believe me some of you don't believe me so let me bring you again to the Greek the word in verse 15 says having disarmed principalities and powers that word powers is the Greek word exosia the word exosia can be translated either into power or authority. Power or authority. We need to understand that at the cross, Jesus freed us from the power of sin. That's what you need to understand. That's what I need to convince myself of. That means that we are not subject to its dominion, to sin's dominion any longer. It's good news. We don't need to succumb to sin any longer, friends. No, not more. We are to live as defeated people because in Christ we are more than conquerors. Praise be our Savior. So what was nailed to the cross? Something was nailed to the cross. That's what the text says. What was nailed to the cross? The bond was nailed to the cross, which means... You don't own anything to anyone. So the bond was nailed to the cross. But not only that, the text also says that the dominion of sin was nailed to the cross. Praise God for that. So you can't blame sin because of what you do. It's your responsibility to sin or not to sin. But you have the power of God to not sin. And if you sin, if you sin, we have an advocate. What was nailed to the cross? The bond, the dominion of sin. But again, what else was the nail? Just that? Well, where do we go to get an answer to that question? The Bible again, friends, because Paul is not done. Verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival. Or your Bibles would say holiday. Or a new moon or Sabbath. Hmm. Do you hear all this? People will take it. See again. I'm, I'm bringing all the passage together. For you to see the whole picture. But some people will take that verse. And they will make a doctrine out of that one particular verse. Just that verse. But I want you to check the little words in the verses. This verse starts by saying so. What is, the word of, what is the meaning of that word, so? What does that mean? It means, 
as a consequence. It means, therefore, it means consequently. So for what I have exposed before, Paul says, now as a result, this is what is going to happen. Let no one judge you in food. That means from the Greek eating, in eating, or in drinking, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths. Now, is this text saying that now I can eat whatever I want? Why are you so sure? Many people use this to say, see, don't judge me. I can eat, I can eat my crab, I can eat my, my uh, oysters, I can eat whatever I want. Don't judge me. The Bible says don't judge me. Is the text talking about that, friends? It's not. It is not talking about that. And here is another principle that we need to get into our minds. Respect the context. Friend, respect the context. Please, respect the context. When you study the Bible, respect the context. As a matter of fact, tell to the person next to you. Tell to the person next to you. Respect the context, please. Respect the context. Tell it, tell it, tell it. Respect the context. So is the text saying that now I can drink whatever I want? It's not. It's not talking about that. Why? Respect the context, please. It continues saying now. The verse continues saying, Oh, there, there is, the, there is uh, the context we need to pay attention to regarding a festival. So this drink and this, and this uh, drinking and this eating has a context. And the context is festival. Regarding a festival. Let's talk about this festival. The word festival comes from the Greek um, uh, heorte. Now, this word heorte is, is, describes a feast day or a holiday. This word heorte is mentioned 27 times in the Bible. How many times? 27 times in the Bible. And in all the time, all these times, 27 times, the word is related to the Jewish feast. No one celebrates. No one celebrates. Heorte, let me try with you guys. Maybe you, you will react. So the word heorte in the Greek tells us, the word tells us that, the, that what we're talking about here is about Jewish feasts. No? Okay. Some people would say, don't call it Jewish feast. Those are not Jewish feasts. Those are the feasts of the Lord. Call it Yahweh's, Yahweh's feast. That's how you are to call it. But, excuse me. But out of the 27 times, 17 times, how many times? 17 times are found in John. And every time John mentions this feast, he will add to the word feast of the Jews. In other words, Jewish feast is a biblical name for it, for this. You still with me? But now, not only says holiday or festival, it also says new moon. What does it say, new moon? What is this referring to? So every month in the Jewish calendar, which is the one that they use, they didn't use our calendar, in the Jewish calendar, every month it started with a new moon, which was a celebration for them, for the Jews. This, this new moon actually comes from a Greek word, which, uh, it's, which its root is the word men. Men. And according to the Thayer lexicon, this word men means, uh, is a verse that refers to a Jewish festival of the new moon. So no doubt we're talking about festivals here, Jewish festivals or Jewish feasts. That's what the Bible says, friends. So the holiday, the festival, was in reference to the Jewish feast. The new moon was in reference to the Jewish feast. What were then the drinking and the eating in reference to? Telling me that I can eat whatever I want? Telling me that I can drink whatever I want? No, no, no. Respect, respect the context. The same Jewish feasts, all these feasts involved eating and drinking. You know that, right? Every time they celebrated Passover, food was involved. Drinking was involved. Every time they celebrate any other of the feasts, they will drink and they will eat together. Let me just give you one example because I see so many of you just 
doubting about what I'm saying. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Ezekiel chapter 45 and verse 17. Look at, the, look at the Bible, friends. This is just one example to show you how drinking and eating is related to the feast, the Jewish feast. Ezekiel 45 and verse 17 says, Then it shall be the prince's part to give burn offerings. Where do we find offerings? Related to what? The feasts. The ceremonial laws. Burn offerings, gain, uh, grain offerings, and drink offerings. At where, friends? When? The feasts. The moon, the new moons, there it is. The Sabbath. Hmm, interesting. The Sabbath is also there in Ezekiel. And at all, at all the appointed seasons, again, the feast of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering, the grain offering, the burn offering, and the peace and the peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. Do you see that this is related to the Jewish feast? Yes or no? All this, my dear friends, all this is part of the law of Moses, not part of the law of God. You don't find these feasts. You don't find these, these celebrations. You don't find these festivals of holidays in the Ten Commandments, do you? All this is related, is found in the law of Moses. But let me be more specific. Are we talking about the whole law of Moses? The answer to that question is no. We are talking about the ceremonial law. That's what the Bible is talking about. The ceremonial law. That's why we went from the Old Testament to the covenants, from the covenants to the law, from the law to the law of Moses. And now we are in a more specific study within the law of Moses, which is the ceremonial law. You still here, friends? That's what Paul is talking about. We need to respect the context. We need to respect the theme that Paul is having when, when uh, Colossians chapter 2 uh, was being written. Now we're talking then about the ceremonial law. The law that had to do with the Jewish festivals and all that happened around the temple. And by the way, the temple was given as the best illustration of the gospel. All these items, friends, in verse 16, being shadows, types, are items found in the ritual law, which typify the sinless life of Christ, the atoning death of Christ, and the priestly ministry of Christ. In other words, these laws pointed forward to Christ. But wait, 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 wait. Are you avoiding talking about the Sabbath? Is that what you're doing, Pastor? Are you going to just pass by the Sabbath and ignore that it says Sabbath? No one, let no one judge you on Sabbaths. Are we, can we just pass by? We will not do that. What about the Sabbaths? What about the Sabbaths that are mentioned there? Respect the context. What is the context about, friends? What is the context about? Ceremonial law. What is that Sabbath about then? Ceremonial law. It clearly says that let no one judge you for the Sabbath. Then let's forget about the Sabbath. Right? Let's, let's just forget about the Sabbath because it says that no one should judge you. That's what people, that's how people take these verses, friends. And we need to be careful because we need to respect the context. Now, are you telling me, people that take this verse like this, are, 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 are we to understand that all this is talking about the Jewish festival? Until it gets to the Sabbath. And when it comes to the Sabbath, it does talk about the law of God and the Ten Commandments. Is that a good interpretation? You will be getting out of the context. Sabbath is not an isolated word, word in the context. It's part of the text. So you have to respect the context. Are you with me, friends? So what is the answer then? What about the Sabbath? What do we do with the Sabbath? Again, the answer is simple. Respect the context. If it is all about the ceremonial law, then the Sabbaths being talked about here must be also about what, friends? The ceremonial law. This is not talking about the weekly Sabbath, family. This is not talking about the weekly Sabbath. And as a matter of fact, let me bring you to the Greek again. I, I know you like the Greek, so here it is. Sabbath comes from Sabbaton. The Greek word for Sabbath is the word Sabbaton. And that means in the Bible can be translated into the seventh day 
of the week or weekly Sabbath or can also be translated into a ceremonial yearly Sabbath. And sometimes it's also translated into week. You find the word Sabbaton and it's translated into week. Let me ask you this question. How do you know which of the three meanings is to be understood when you read a text? What was that? Context. Respect the context. How do you know which of the three meanings to, 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 uh, to use when you translate? Respect the context. Everything before the Sabbath is the ceremonial law. So what is the context of the Sabbath here? The ceremonial law. Is that clear, friends? So, it's not talking about the weekly Sabbath. Because the Bible clearly teaches about two different kinds of Sabbaths. The ceremonial Sabbaths and the weekly Sabbath. You with me, friends? The ceremonial Sabbath, now listen to me, pointed forward to the Redeemer. And the weekly pointed for backward to the Creator. Let me repeat this. The ceremonial Sabbath pointed forward to the Redeemer. And the weekly pointed for backward to the Creator. You don't believe me. Let me show you verse 17, which is the last verse. Verse 17 will tell us that what we are understanding out of the text is actually what Paul meant. Read with me verse 17. It says, which are shadow, a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Check the little words. It says, which, 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 the drinking, the eating, the holidays or festivals, the new moon, and what else? The Sabbath. So this is what Paul is saying. The drinking, the eating, the festivals, the new moon, and the Sabbath, all five are shadow of the things to come. You hear, friends? You still awake? A shadow of the, they are a shadow of the things to come. Now, let me clarify this, friends. The weekly Sabbath is not a shadow of the things to come. The weekly Sabbath is a memorial of the thing that came, that happened already. Namely, creation. That's why when you go to Genesis chapter 2, the Sabbath appears where? At creation. That's why you go, when you go to Exodus chapter 20, to the law of God, the Ten Commandments, verses 11 through uh, 8 through 11, you will see that the reason to keep the Sabbath holy is what? Creation. So again, the weekly Sabbath is not a shadow of the things to come. The weekly Sabbath is a memorial of the thing that already came, already happened. Creation. The seven-day Sabbath, friends, was not instituted to point Christ as the Redeemer. The seven-day Sabbath was, point, was instituted to point at Christ as the Redeemer, as the Creator of, of this world. Every time we come together and praise our God, mainly we praising Him because He created, he created the world. So which are the, the a shadow of things to come? Which are those? He says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Here, friends, I want you to remember this. We're moving from the shadow to the substance. We're moving from the shadow to the substance. Dear friends, this is talking about the law. This is talking about the law of Moses. And to be more specifically, it is talking about the ceremonial law. Yes or no? If you don't believe me, I will have to prove, you, prove it to you again. This shadow of things to come, this phrase, is found only in a different place, in another place in the whole New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Let's see what Paul says there in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Listen to that phrase. Look for the phrase. Shadow of the things to come. For the law, says Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. Having a shadow of good things to come. Is that the same phrase, yes or no? Another very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices. Where do you use sacrifices? What law is that? Somebody. Ceremonial law, which they offer. Where do you offer? Where do you offer? Ceremonial law. Continually, year by year, ceremonial law. Make those who approach perfect. What are those? What are we talking about? The law, the ceremonial law. The Jewish festivals. Right? The Jewish feasts. Now, here is a, a serious question. Serious question that we need to deal with. Do we need to keep this today? Do we need to keep this 
feast today, this Jewish feast today? I think it's fair to tackle that question. Do we need to keep him? Do we need to continue celebrating this feast, this, this shadow? Do we? I, I, um, I go to, to see my parents once a year. And uh, I go to see them because I just miss them. All, all my, my two, my dad, my mom, they both are in, they live in Ecuador. And I try to go there at least once a year. One of the times that I went to Ecuador, I, I was th thinking about what to give my dad so that he would be busy, being retired, and he is also a Parkinson's uh, patient. I thought maybe he needs something to, to, be, to be busy, to, to have something to do. And I brought him a camera, a digital camera. This was the greatest gift that I could ever given to my dad. The moment he received that camera, you saw that life came to him. And from that moment on, every time he dressed, he will also put, to go out, he will also put the camera around his neck to go out. He will not go anywhere without his camera. And everywhere he went, he would take pictures of people. He would just be around and talk. As a matter of fact, they called my dad by then the paparazzi. You know what paparazzi is? He was called the paparazzi because he was always taking pictures of people. Always. All the time. Every, every event, church, every Sabbath, he was always taking pictures. Paparazzi. Here is paparazzi coming. Paparazzi. Paparazzi. Well, you know what? Uh, my, my mom used to tell me that my dad would spend like pretty much better, better part of the day on his bed looking at the camera, checking the pictures that he took all day long. But my mom told me that there were special pictures in that camera that he will, he will keep in the camera forever. He will also copy, it, copy those pictures, those special pictures into the, into the computer. And he will have also a digital frame that he will also have those same pictures. You know who those pictures were? I'm out of three brothers. I'm the baby of the three brothers. And I'm the only one who lives away from them. So every time I went back to my country, every time I went to back to my home to see my parents, my dad would take pictures of me. And he would let, look at the pictures. And when I was away, my, my mom would tell me, when I'm, I'm away, my dad would be watch, looking at the pictures and looking at the pictures and looking at the pictures. And the next year came in, right? And I went back. What do you think my dad did when I got there? Do you think that he went back to his room to sit on the bed and start looking at the pictures? Or do you think that he will give me all the attention, all the kisses, all the hugs that I needed at that moment? What do you think he did? He spent time with the pictures or he came to actually spend time with me because I was there. Do you understand what's happening here, friends? This, my friends, is what happens with the ceremonial laws and feasts. We are not obliged to continue keeping them because the substance already came and now we can enjoy, enjoy his company from shadow to substance to the Savior. Forget about the shadow because the substance, the body, the Savior is here. You can have him. You can spend time with him. You don't need to look at the pictures anymore because the Savior is here. He already came. You don't need pictures anymore. You don't need shadows anymore. Because the substance is here. So which are a shadow of things to come? Is what Paul says. What is that thing that was to come? Paul, what is that thing that was to come that you're referring to? I'm here to tell you, friends, that that thing is... The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. That's the thing that Paul is talking about. The cross of Christ. Because at the cross, the Lamb of God was crucified for our sins. Because at the cross, the Son of God was separated from His Father to bring us to His Father. Because at the cross, Jesus died to pay our debt and fulfill your pending bond. Because at the cross... We see the greatest demonstration of the love of God for you and for me. A God that didn't stem his life higher than your life. 
that decided to surrender it for you. What a God. Church, what a God. This is a God worthy of our presence. This is a God that you are to praise today. This is a God that you are to give your life today. This is a God that has paid doubly and triply for your life. Next time Satan says to you, you are a sinner. You don't deserve God's love. You don't deserve to call yourself a Christian. Next time the enemy says to you, you don't deserve to be a child of God. You're so filthy. You're so crooked. You don't deserve to be a son. You don't deserve to be a daughter of God. Tell him. Point at the cross and tell him my debt was paid fully. I can rest on Christ because my dead was nailed to the cross. I don't need to continue celebrating the feasts because that was nailed to the cross. You want to use it to educate, that's fine. You want to experience it once in a while with your children, that's fine. Use them. But don't impose that on people. It's not a requirement. It's not an obligation anymore. Because the picture is not necessary, is not needed when the person is here and Jesus is here. Jesus already came, friends. The one that nailed it already came. And he came to stay. But he doesn't want to stay in this world only. He wants to stay in your hearts he wants to dwell in your heart he wants to live in your heart because that's the only place that he cares for because that's the only place that needs to be restored renewed transformed and so here's my question friends as we come to the end of this series who lives in your heart Who is inhabiting your heart? Who is there? If you open your heart right now, who is to be found in that heart? If your answer is not Jesus, there's this appeal, this, this invitation right here is for you. If Jesus hasn't been in your heart for a while, if you decided to bring a different dweller into your heart for a while, I want you to make a decision right now, right here for Jesus.